Good evening, everybody, and welcome to Strand. My name is Sabir, and I direct events here. For a little bit of history, Strand was founded in 1927 by the Bass family over on 4th Avenue's Book Row. Stretching from Union Square to Astor Place, Book Row gradually dwindled until after over 91 years, Strand is the sole survivor, still run by the Bass family, and still housing new and used books. Tonight, we're happy to welcome Sarah Bowen to the Rare Book Room to discuss her brand new book, Spiritual Rebel, a positively addictive guide to finding deeper perspective and higher purpose. It follows her experience studying the world's faith traditions at the One Spirit Interfaith Seminary in the wake of her first book, the Nautilus Award-winning Void of Detached, Seeking Modern Spirituality Through My Father's Old Sermons. In addition to graduating from One Spirit, Sarah has studied at Chicago Theological Seminary, Emerson Theological Institute, the Chopra Center, and Omega Institute. And if that's not enough, she channels her interest in the intersection of spiritual values with animal welfare into her work as an animal chaplain. Please join me in welcoming Sarah and Spiritual Rebel to Strand. I'd like to start every day like that. That was wonderful, thank you guys. I'm Sarah and I'm a spiritual rebel. And thank you to Cynthia, to Sabir, to all of the staff at The Strand for hosting us today. Thank you to Monkfish Book Publishing Company for bringing the book to life. And to Gretchen and February Media for great PR support. And thank you all for showing up. As a writer, I have dreams sometimes that we do these things and the audience is my three cats. <laughs> and so it's really, and my husband, my wonderful husband. Um, so it's really nice to have all of you here. And I have two other thank yous I'd like to do. My husband, Sean, who not once complained how much time has become book time away writing for nine months. And my tribe from One Spirit, especially founder Diane Burke, who taught me the meaning of unconditional love. <laughs> and also taught me that we start everything with a piece of music. We don't have the ability to do that, so we're gonna start with spiritual practice. <laughs> so I invite you all to take a moment, to take a deep breath, to close your eyes, or if that's not comfortable, just to look down something slightly unfocused. And we're going to do something called amazing. Being amazed, being amazed means letting go of figuring everything out. When observing something, we stay in the moment, letting the felt sense of astonishment, amazement, and wonderment seep into us. Radical amazement becomes a mode of being. So take a deep breath and consider the vastness of the universe. Breathe in and out slowly, contemplating how far up is. Notice the movement and the feeling of anything in this room. Consider the sun is 93 million miles above us. And now consider, you are a tiny part of a massive galaxy, one of over 100 billion galaxies, with the nearest one 600,000 light years from us. Each year, a thousand tons of Martian rocks rain down on Earth from nearly 34 million miles away. And tonight, when you step outside, the nearest star will be 25 trillion miles from where you are. You are one of over seven billion humans among 8.7 million more species of life on Earth. Consider how small you are, 
one tiny blip in an ever-expanding, increasing connected universe. And now open your eyes gently and take a look at your hand. And consider these ideas. Around 10,000 different species of microorganisms call you home. Your body is made up of around 37.2 trillion cells, two billion of which are in your heart alone. Your nose can recognize almost a trillion different scents. And information is zooming along your nerves at about 250 miles per hour. Consider how large you are. An entire world lives within you. And that's what I call amazing. That's one of the practices in the book, Spiritual Rebel. There's 21 days of practices. And tonight we're gonna to talk a little bit about my journey to the book. Then we're gonna talk about why the book isn't all about me and why it might be of interest to you. And then we're gonna have some Q&A. Does that sound okay? All right. I'm going to read a couple small excerpts for each one of these pieces. I promise you, all of them are no longer than one page. I wanna keep the good stuff for when you get the book and read it. But I'm gonna start my story by reading the first page of the book and the chapter entitled, The F Word. <laughs> it started with the F word, not the highly charged four letter F-U-C-K, not the saintly five letter faith. It started with the force, because in the beginning there was the word, or in my case, the words. They appeared as gigantic yellow characters in all caps rolling up a darkened movie theater screen. A wise sage named Obi-Wan Kenobi vividly described a mystical energy called the Force and my life was forever changed. Afterward, my imaginative friends and I met daily to act out stories about the Force, creating our own complex variants over time. With an unbridled spirit, we dubbed ourselves honorary members of the Rebel Alliance, standing bravely against any injustice or evil in our suburban neighborhood. We thought ourselves rare space warriors, but we were unknowingly taking part in an age-old hero's journey, which had been acted out for millennia. Inspired by the original Star Wars trilogy, we applied the archetypal drama to our everyday lives on Earth. Unsurprisingly, the myth of Star Wars felt more alive than what I learned when I learned at church. Star Wars had what my favorite Bible stories had. It had heroes, heroines, and wise sages called Luke, Leia, and Yoda. But unlike my church's religion, our Star Wars religiosity seemed more expansive and less exclusive than in my church. It was literally universal. Our neighborhood was a mashup of mostly Jewish and Catholic kids with a few of us Protestants scattered around for good measure. Our families all had different religious beliefs and rituals, but there was one thing we kids could agree on, the awesome power of the force. Ooh, again, you guys come over tomorrow morning. As a preacher's kid, pop culture began to mingle for me with what I learned at church. So Noah, Moses, and Jesus got mingled with the Force and Aslan and Gandalf and everything else that I was consuming. And I like this quote from Mr. Rogers. Anybody else raised on Mr. Rogers? And he said, what we see and hear on the screen is part of who we become. And so I think all of these myths came and mingled and became part of my spiritual DNA. But it wasn't enough to sustain me from staying sane, unfortunately. I had the genetics for addiction. It was clear that my brain didn't work the same way that other people's brains worked. And I had questions about my sexuality that it, during a time when it really wasn't something you talked about. And so I left my religion behind, and I chased a lot of unhealthy things for decades. Sex, drugs, rock and roll, all of that. And finally, in my 30s, I was struggling with stress. I was struggling with Lyme disease, addiction, 
overwork, and my father died. And so I reached out like that tiny little princess of my childhood, help me Obi-Wan Kenobi, you're my only hope, except it was help me Helen, you're my only hope. And a friend helped me get to 12-step recovery. But I was still really angry with God about my father's death. So I used the force of my childhood, something to sustain me until I could start saying the G word again. And then I started digging into my father's sermons. I had 1,500 of them because that's what we inherit when we're preacher's kids. We don't get millions, we get lots of manila folders. And I started reading through them. And these ones had too much of this and these had not enough of that, and this had this word that triggered me, and that had that word that triggered me, and it took about seven years for me to wake, make my way through those. And in the process, I wrote a book, because that's, <laughs> that's what you do when you have 1,500 sermons. And as I was going through it, I realized that what I was learning also was in other religions. And so I started getting other books and other manila folders and it became a real mess. And then my husband at one point said to me, I love to hear what you're learning, but I'm full and go find your people. <laughs> Some of my people are here, the ones laughing loudly. <laughs> and so I did find my people and I found myself in an interfaith seminary, which is the last place I expected to find myself in my 40s. And there I went from a preacher's kid with no religion to a middle-aged adult with all religions. <laughs> and I found this quote from Gandhi, who's more impressive than I, so I'm gonna use it, who said, when he was asked, are you a Hindu? His response supposedly is, yes, I am. And I'm also a Muslim, a Christian, a Buddhist, and a Jew. And so all of a sudden, I had that same type of idea. And that's when I became spiritually rebellious. And after seminary, which I coyly call serenity school to people for whom <laughs> seminary might be a little triggering, um, I found myself constantly recommending books and websites and apps and just all this stuff. You must read this, you must read this. And I wanted it in a little, a little version, right, that I could hand people and say, you must read this. And so that's how Spiritual Rebel happened. And so the book has really three sections in it. And this is why it might be interesting to you. The first part is about our beliefs. As people who are spiritually rebellious, we don't necessarily have someone telling us what to believe in. We have to figure that out ourselves. And I found that there were a lot of things I had been told as a child, or things I hadn't been told, but somehow I had heard and I had taken in that no longer seemed true. And so I had to go through the process of figuring out what's true for me, what's not, what do I keep, what do I throw into my sacred trash, and how do I figure out what my own spiritual path is. And so in the book, the first part of it takes you through a process of, of sorting through your own sacred trash. And when I did that, my publisher said, yeah, but you gotta put yours in the book. And I said, I don't wanna put my trash in the book. And they said yes, and four times they sent it back to me and said, there's more, isn't there? There's more trash, isn't there? Juicier, spicier. And so I ended up with pages and pages. I'm going to read you just a few bullet points of what ended up in my sacred trash. And I'll admit that releasing long-held beliefs is not always an easy task. Some of us have been threatened with some pretty horrible consequences if we think for ourselves. Others of us may have intermingled our principles and personalities to such an extent that we worry without them, who will I be? A friend once described the process to me as, my insides are being rearranged. Letting go can be uncomfortable, spine-chillingly scary, somberly sad, disorienting, and at the same time, it can also be joyful and hair-raisingly exciting, freeing, relieving, delightfully comforting. Embracing a both and instead of an either or approach, we can let all of these feelings intermingle. And so as I began to write, my chest tight, I started to write a list. I do not believe that not believing in all the religious ideas my father did dishonors him in any way. 
I do not believe that pop culture myths are any less worthy of study than age-old spiritual ones. I do not believe that being spiritual means I'm entitled to bash religions or religious people. I do not believe that religion and science are opposites. And I certainly don't believe that prayer is only for Christians and meditation only for Buddhists. I don't believe that because I don't agree with all the tenets of a religion, I have to throw it entirely away. I don't believe that the scandals by some religious people negate the entire religion or the compassionate work that institutions do to help their communities. And finally, I don't believe that wanting to embody the traits of a Jedi is somehow not real spirituality. <laughs> These statements flowed out of me, decades in the making. And after that, I was freed to connect with whatever that thing is, the F word, the G word, the J word, the one of the 200 words I assembled in the back of the book, because I like choice. <laughs> I can use any of those words. I can use all of those words. I can use none of those words. In fact, if I didn't get your word in here, I gave you half a page to put yours in, <laughs> OK? Because it's about connecting to something bigger than our egos. It isn't about the name of that thing. And so the rest of the book talks about what do we do as spiritual rebels? And I'm defining a spiritual rebel as the following. If you resist being pigeonholed, limited, or even defined, you might be a spiritual rebel. I see a couple of you in the room. So the second part goes through deeper perspective. So there's 21 days of practices, and they have a theme because I like alliteration, and I like to write words. So we have Mindful Mondays, Talking Tuesdays, Wonder-Filled Wednesdays, Trekking Thursdays, which is not all about Star Trek, Fearless Fridays. These are all practices to help us connect with ourselves and connect with whatever our F word is. And then on the weekends, we expand beyond ourselves. So Saturdays are Save Us Saturdays, service, helping others, charity, volunteering, whatever that piece is. This morning I was sitting next to a woman who was on crutches and having a really, really hard time. And she was sitting in this, this lounge and everyone was kind of ignoring her because she was bumping around everybody. And I walked up to her and I said, would you like a cup of coffee? I'll go get it for you. She said, what? So I got to jump on Save a Saturday. Sangha Sundays. Sangha is community. Spiritual rebels, not all of us get up in the morning like I did as a child to go to church on Sunday morning. Some of us do. Some of us go on Friday nights to Shabbat. Some of us go on Wednesdays to a meditation center, right? But someday during the week, we need community. And so Sunday has practices around how do we find our people? And how do we also go find the people that we think aren't our people, but we have some stuff to learn from? And I call that sacred space crashing. And I love to do that. Go somewhere and say, tell me about what you believe, right? The final part of the book is about higher purpose. And so what I did is I started speaking to other spiritual rebels. And I said, tell me about you. Again, don't want a book all about myself, right? So I started to reach out to people and say, what are you doing? What's your higher purpose? What drives you? And so I want to share just a couple stories with you guys, and then we'll go into a Q&A. The first person is Joshua Combs. And he is, or was, a hairstylist in London. And one day he was on a break, and he's sitting out on the street, and he sees a homeless kid next to him, and he realizes he has that, you know, the long, beautiful thing of uh, scissors. That, that hairstylists have. They wrap them all up and take them home with them like chefs with knives, right? So he has his kit with him, and he says to the kid, can I give you a haircut? The guy says, yeah. So he cut his hair, and then he cut someone else's hair. And he's been doing this for quite some time now, a couple of years. That's all he does now. He cuts people's hair, documenting it on Instagram with their story. So what he's doing is he's seeing people that aren't always seen. He's hearing people that aren't always heard. And it's not about the haircut. But they do look really good. He's quite talented. And he started his own hashtag called Do Something for Nothing. 
And what he did is encouraged people to post their own stories, to post their own do-somethings for nothing. And when I talked with him, we were having an interview, and I started to talk to him about the force. And he said, stop, stop, stop. He said, you'll never believe what I'm seeing right now. And I said, what? And he said, I'm looking across the street at a pub, and the entire wall of it has a picture of Carrie Fisher, and it says, the rebel's princess. You can't make these things up, folks. You just can't. Ask my husband. We have a Star Wars bathroom. Um, the second person I'd like to tell you about is Carla Kamstra. And Carla is an incredible animal lover. And one of the things she realized is that we are all posting a lot of stuff on Facebook with animals that is cute and funny, but not necessarily compassionate to those animals. And so she started something called CHIP, Compassionate and Humane Internet Posting. And so what she did was create a web resource to help people understand, because she's an, an animal advocate and works in um, a clinic, actually started a clinic, um, but she understands the stress signals for animals. So she started a page that would give us that information so that we can look at, eh, I don't know, the cat with the lime on his head? Not sure if that's a good idea to resend that one. That was my favorite one. I had to give it up. Third one is my friend Artie Roots Ross, who just walked the Camino de Santiago last year. And for anyone who's walked the Camino, it's hundreds of miles across Spain. It's a beautiful, beautiful pilgrimage. Um, but what she did is she walked, she walked it to raise money for charity water. One in 10 people in the world do not have access to clean water. One in 10. And so she walked to raise money. And because of her in that interview, for each copy of Spiritual Rebel that we sell, we also give a donation to Charity Water. Darby Christopher watched a uh, documentary called Solitary Nation, got so interested in the issues in jails that she decided to confine herself in her bathroom with the lights on, no soft services, no food for 23 hours, and documented on video. And it's remarkable to see just what happened to her after 23 hours in those conditions, right? These are things that don't require us to get 501c3 status. These are things that don't require a lot of money. But these are places where we can find those things that we feel like they break our heart and the things that bring us great joy and we can bring them together to try to solve some of these problems that are weighing very heavily on us. All these stories centered around higher purpose. And so the book ends with some reflective activities to help you guys deep further, dig further into yours. I'm sure you all have excellent higher purposes. But we can always find something else that might surprise us. And so I want to end before we do our Q&A with just a paragraph and a half. I think it's crucial that our spiritual lives are not about merely chasing joy, serenity, and bliss. In times of stress or loss, our deeper perspective can provide the support we need to deal with the pain that we are experiencing inside. Further, it can help us be the life preserver for those around us who are suffering. As we traipse along through our chaotic world, a world brimming with conflict, our spiritual connection can provide much needed balance and healing. Like the Japanese art of kintsugi, where cracks in pottery are mended with powdered gold, we can repair our broken parts not by hiding them, but by shining light into our fractures, honoring them as part of our history, pieces of who we are. Spirituality is the golden glue that holds us together solidly enough to ask the most profound questions. And so now I want to hear some of yours. Thank you. If you want to raise your hand when you have a question, I can run the microphone to you just since we're recording. Thanks, Sabir. Hi. 
Okay, so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how you apply spirituality like to your daily actions. Like, what, um, like what's your daily schedule? Like having breakfast, like what is the experience of that with the added spiritual re rebellion? Sure. For many years, I shamed myself for not being able to get on my meditation cushion every morning for an hour. And I realized that I needed a little bit of variety in what I do. And so what I do each day is try to find the sacred in each activity I'm doing. So when I wake up in the morning, it starts with a little bit of reading. Right? I'm a big book addict, so there's a little bit of spiritual reading. There's a little bit of meditation with my cats. I found they're excellent to meditate with. I toss an I Ching with my goldfish Picasso, uh, which I love to do. And I draw a few, a few cards from some decks that have little books with them that kind of give me some focus for the day, right? So it's a help kind of figuring out, all right, what, what's going on today and how do I want to direct that way? During the day, I try to make sure that I'm doing things with gratitude. I try to make sure that I'm not being an asshole. That's an important spiritual practice. <laughs> I, I try to give love to the people around me. I try to connect to the people around me. Um, I have extended this into what I eat and what I consume, which I think are spiritual practices as well. So during the day, I'm looking at things and I'm trying to be grateful for the process of whatever brought the food to my table or whatever I'm using. And because I'm a 12-stepper, at night, I do what's called a 10th step, which is a daily review of my day. And I look at what went well, what didn't go well? Maybe where I was an asshole. <laughs> I might need to correct. Oh, and we're videotaping. Sorry about the language. I used my fancy spiritual words again. Um, but I look at that at the end of the day for a reflection. And then I do a lot on the weekends with service and with community. I'm part of a, the One Spirit community. I'm part of a, a synagogue uh, in New York City. I go to a Unitarian Universalist church. And as I mentioned before, I'd like to be a Jedi. So I watch a lot of Star Wars. So I think that's a long answer. And the short version is that wherever someone finds connection, meaning, and purpose can be a spiritual practice. And it doesn't have to look the same for me every day. Um, and it, it's whatever's feeding and nourishing those things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, Sarah, now that your child has been born here, yeah. um, what do you wish was in it that didn't get there? So it was originally three um, times as large. <laughs> my first book was very long. Um, my publisher said shorten it. And so one of the things, God bless the internet. Um, so one of the things I did was start a website for all the other resources and the things that I collected after we went to print to add those in as well. Which is? Oh, which is spiritual-rebel.com. And so my hope is as I keep learning and as I keep collecting and as I keep finding more books and apps and websites and all of that to, to, to keep expanding. Yeah. So I'm going to ask the inevitable question. What was the hardest part of writing this book, do you think? I was saying to my husband earlier today that I feel like I'm a talker who writes as opposed to a writer who talks. And so I think when you put something in a book and then it goes out into the world and you're trying to have it do what it's supposed to do, um, you have to be really careful about making sure that you stay authentic to what the message of your book is. And I think that was the hardest part. Um, I would have someone say, well, maybe there's a little too much of this or a little too much of that or maybe this is a little too weird or you know, that kind of process of sussing out and trying to stay authentic to, to, to me and to what that message is, right? Because there's a lot of books out there, and they're wonderful. Um, but 
this was a viewpoint that, that I wanted to bring out, this kind of mix and match and resource. And I, I keep saying I'm an inner spiritual tour guide. So the book does not have all the answers. It has the roads and the maps to, to get you to go find the answer for you. That's a great question. Thank you. It's not easy to write these things. No. Hey, Sarah. W one of your, um, <clears throat> your services is as an animal chaplain. How did that come about? It came about when I was six. <laughs> and I started bringing home dead chipmunks in my lunchbox to bury them in my mother's rose bushes. And I would forget on the way home, and I would put the lunchbox <laughs> in the kitchen, and my mother would yell, Sarah! I was a six-year-old who was taken to funeral homes with my father on the way from here to there, right? So in hindsight, it makes a lot of sense what I was doing. It was sacred. It was a life. And uh, when I met my husband, uh, we, were, we were going along one day. We live in the Hudson Valley. There's a lot of animals that are killed on the road. And I met my husband, and we're driving in the car. We were dating at the time, and he smacks, he smacks his hand like this. And I'm like, what is that guy doing? Like, he's having a heart attack? What's going on? And, and he said, oh, I'm giving my blessing for that animal dead in the road. And I was like, oh, my soulmate. <laughs> yes. Yes. So when I was in seminary, and I started to talk, this wonderful seminary, One Spirit, um, when I started to talk about this, the wonderful staff there said, have you ever considered animal chaplaincy? And I said, what is that? Wow. And so there's two parts to it uh, for me. One of it is, is animal advocacy, right? So there's a lot of work around what's happening with climate right now, what's happening with agribusiness, factory farming, all of that. And then there's the other piece of how important our companion animals are to us. For a lot of us, they're, they're family members, right? And we don't necessarily have the services for what happens when they get sick. Uh, what happens when we have to make decisions about their medical care, about life, about that. And so as an animal chaplain, I work with people to try to figure those things out. And I think also we have a lot of people who are an aging population. Well, I mean, the population's always aging, right? But we have people who have animals that are maybe their, their core support. And what do you do with anticipatory grieving? Or what do you do with thoughts when you get sick about what happens to that animal, right? So animal chaplaincy steps into that gap and says that this species is as important as this species, right? And so let's provide care and service for that. It's cool. Do we have any more questions? The question is, if someone wants to be more spiritualistic, where do they start? What would they do? What, the question was, if you want to be more spiritual, how do you start? Small, I think. So in the book, the, the first thing that we start with is breathing, right? The idea of what happens with the breath and what happens when we connect to the breath. And, and I think that when we slow down, and we start there, that's, that's a good place. I think the second thing is to look at what calls you, right? What do you feel like you're connected or you're feeling more spiritual when you're doing it, right? What are those things that, that feel like personally for you, they help your spirituality? And so what I tried to do in the book was to come up with so many things that people could say, yeah, that doesn't work for me, but this does, but that doesn't, but this does. Because we have to try things, I think. I was saying the other day when I was raised, I had two options for spiritual practice. I had prayer. Well, actually, I had one. Well, prayer and going to church were what were provided to me. And then when I got into 12-step, I added meditation. And then when I went to seminary, I added like 42,000 other things. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm still collecting more. So, so I think it's... Does that make sense? That it, it, it's, we start small and we try to figure out what, what are these things that feel like they're connecting me? Yeah. Is there a book number three in the works? 
No. <laughs> <laughs> and we if were, so, what? We were just having this conversation earlier. Um, I wake up some mornings and say, I look at the list of the 14 other titles I've written for books. I'm going to write this one. And then I wake up some days and go, uh-uh, not again. It's a lot of work. Um, so I don't know. Uh, in the, at the end of the book, um, one of the things that I talk about is this, this term that I've kind of mashed a couple words together called spiritual tarian. And it goes through this idea of, you know, I was struggling with what I was eating, and was I a vegetarian, was I a vegan? I found these folks called the Reducitarians, which I love. Um, great, a great book, and there's a little bit of information on Brian Cateman's work in, in Spiritual Rebel. And this idea of our food being linked to what's going on with the climate. I mean, it's the biggest problem that we have right now is not our, it's not our cars, it's, it's our cows, right? So how do we make those decisions and how do we figure that out? So in the book, I take people through an exercise of looking at, at what we consume so people can make their own choices. And I call that spiritualitarian. So I'd like to do a little more work around that. I'm doing some work um, with Chicago Theological right now in that, in that area. And so maybe something will come out of that but I need to spend a little more time with my husband first. So please join me in thanking Sarah for a wonderful conversation. Thank you, thank you. I have a couple closing, closing comments. Um, it takes a village to launch a book. It takes a tribe. So if you find the book valuable, please consider doing three things. Post about it. We're using hashtag spiritual rebel. Post a review on Goodreads, Amazon, IndieBound, uh, anything like that. And if you have friends in the following locations, suggest they come and see us when we're touring there. We're doing a lot of workshops on the West Coast, and we're going to do one here in New York as well. So we're going to be in Seattle, Portland, Santa Fe, Ann Arbor, Mount Holly, which is near Philly, and a bunch of places in California. We're going to be at the Brooklyn Book Festival, the Baltimore Book Festival. And then on Sunday, January 26th, I'm going to do a full day of this, which is very interactive, real juicy and spicy, at One Spirit. Uh, and you can find out more about that on my website or theirs. Um, and for people who sign up on the web form on my site, I'm giving away one free. So sign up and you may win a free workshop. That's January 26th. And thanks again to Oblong, to Monkfish Publishing, to One Spirit, and to everybody who showed up today. Thank you.